Now it's probably a good time to do a follow-up video on all the questions and answers on the, uh, the shed build. I just completed that maybe a week or so ago. And I got a lot of comments uh, through the video about how much the shed cost and uh, other questions in relation to building the shed. So I thought this is a good time to probably put this in this forum here, answer those questions as best I can. First question, why are we building the shed off-grid? Well, to answer that, basically have the thirst and an ambition to go live off-grid and in a place that we really love and that's in the Atherton Tablelands, northern Queensland in Australia, rolling green hills, black and white cows. The weather's more moderate. Townsville's a hot climate, Atherton Tablelands is still a tropical climate but it's a bit milder. We want a bit of acreage, a bit of greenness around us and... Much more grinding, punk. <laughs> <laughs> Take two. Oh, yeah. And, uh, the kids are just about off our hands now, so probably next year we're going to move up to the Atherton Tablelands and the little town called Wandekla, just outside of Herberton there. And we're going to, well, we've already built the shed, we'll build a little cabin, and we'll build a house, and we'll bring you along with the journey. So exciting times for us, lots of work. Uh, and we needed a new workshop to, uh, to work out of. I'm, I've outgrown my current workshop, although I absolutely love this workshop. Uh, it's eight meters by four meters, the amount of equipment I have in here. I have to move out every day to make some working space and that's just what its life is like. And it's been really great, I'm not complaining about that, but if you get the opportunity to build a new shed, make it bigger. And add about 20% to it once you think you've got your right size. So who would build a shed? Well, I chose to build the shed myself because to save money. Um, I have a skill set and a tool set that can enable that. So it's something you need to consider, your own skills, your own uh, fitness and the tools that you have and also uh, a network of people that can actually lend you a hand. So that's one of the most difficult things. So we'll talk about that a little bit further down the track, but building it by yourself is very difficult. You need some help along the way. So I basically, to answer that question, to save money. How much did we save? Well, I'll go through the cost of the shed very soon, all up $50,000 approximately that we spent to actually stand the shed that you see. We got quotes of $95,000 to $100,000 to actually build the same shed. So it's a saving of approximately $50,000. To spend $50,000, you're gonna pay tax so that's about seventy seventy five thousand dollars that you have to or have earned to spend the fifty. So how hard was the build? If you start out with the big pile of materials and all these nuts and bolts and instruction manuals, it's daunting, but really it's not hard. Shed kits these days, that's something that made my life easier. It was a shed kit. Now, most parts have some sort of sticker on it or a label or some sort of identifier to help you to understand where that part goes in line with the drawings that you should be given. Although at times the instructions lead you down the wrong track, you need to look at the drawings. You've probably got about two or three sets of drawings, your, your inventory and an instruction manual to work out what you actually have to do. So when you're having your, your cup of tea or your, your biscuit, sit down, have a look at your drawings and just check out the next step or the next step ahead. It helps. Things are interrelated with building. So what was hard about it? Probably all the manual handling, um, lifting of heavy bits of steel and things like that. That's where, like I said, you need somebody to help you if you can, if that's possible. You can do it by yourself, but it's going to take you a lot longer to do, and you have to have more equipment, like lifting equipment, to actually help you to do the things. You need something to help you to do it. Go ahead, if you want to go build it by yourself, I, I wish you the best. It can be done, it's just going to be a lot harder for you. All right, picking a supplier. Shed kit suppliers these days all deliver a fairly similar product. What you should be looking for are testimonials on that company to see if they deliver what they say they deliver. So go do your homework on that. Uh, there's one thing, my experience with my supplier, good supplier, I got let down by the after sales. The, the, the sales team worked really hard on the design. We did 10 design changes before we ended up with the shed that we have. 
and I was very happy with them and I phoned up the, the guy I was working with and uh, gave him a pat on the back and I told him I appreciated his help. I did feel quite left down. If you watch the video, I was missing some um, column base plates at the very ends of the buildings, both ends. And so I had to start the building from the middle and work my way out. And that's not how you do buildings. I felt completely unsupported. Still to this day, they didn't seem interested in supporting me at all. So that was a real letdown for me. And at the time, you sort of ask yourself, what do I do? How do I overcome this? And, and luckily for me, and look for some help and I got some suppliers in town to give me to get some brackets for me that was great but initially you're depending upon that supplier organization that you went through to give you the bit so you're trying to work through the problems with them if they're very slow not interested they're not going to get back to you in time or give you the answer that you want and then another day goes past you try again and they still don't give you the answer that you want and another day goes past it's very frustrating it's gonna adjust this camera a little bit that's why I say, do your homework on the company that you're going with. Look at people's testimonials. It matters, it really does. One of the things I noticed in the comments were a lot of people had the same problem as me, um, which is really, really unfortunate with, uh, with kit sheds because it's a logistics exercise and for all you kit shed suppliers out there, look after your customers. They put their faith into you. They spent their good, good hard earned money and gave it to you. You need to make sure that they don't feel um, unsupported, really, really important. And the kit shed supplier that, that uh, dealt with me, you, should, you need to look at yourselves and, and fix those problems. You sucked at the time. Another tip there with the supplier, cheapest is not always the best. Well, sometimes they're cheap for a reason. Check the testimonials out again. Just an example, one of my neighbors who's built his own shed home, he picked a local supplier and he did have problems as well but his supplier came out pretty much to his block and helped him out and delivered delivered an answer or a result quick time. If you have the opportunity to use a local supplier, that would be a wise thing to do, provided that they have good testimonials. Okay, the legal stuff. So you need to have some legal things squared away before you actually make a start on. Still shit though, doing your building. So for me, First of all, I had to check on my land whether I could actually build on it. In the Athens Tablelands, there's some sensitive areas and some not so sensitive areas. So just check that you can build. As a matter of fact, we just bought a block of land which we opted out of the contract about three months before that had the squ uh, squatter pigeon and a black-throated finch on it and the real estate agent didn't tell us. We couldn't build on that block of land. Basically buying it for conservation purposes. In Australia, if you want to build, uh, you need to have an owner builder permit. To get the owner builder permit, you need an owner builder course. To get the owner builder course, you need an industry white card, which is basically an industry induction. Safety, there's safety. And then once you've got those, you can apply for your owner builder permit. All right, so I'll, I'll add that into all the costs of the shed build, so we'll talk about that more. A lot of red tape and a bit of green tape in there as well. You know, if you own a builder course, they're not telling you how to build anything. They're just telling you your legal responsibilities. When something goes wrong, your ass is in the sling. Okay, so you got your land, you got your approval. We had to clear our land. We had trees everywhere. We had to get a bulldozer in and clear a pad. But not just the pad itself, we needed to clear in case any trees would fall over. We're still in a cyclone area, hurricane, whatever you want to call it. If the tree fell over, it crushed the shed. So we had to remove all the trees around that. We had to level the ground there too. Had to do it like a cut and fill. The ground's like that, we had to make it level. So your kit is on its way. You've made arrangements with the supplier that's turning up on the day. Um, when, it, when it arrives, you have to make sure there's an area big enough for a truck to basically get in there and drop it off with the, the crane that's on the truck. But you may need to think about that. When it arrives, do a 100% check on that kit. They'll give you an inventory. Check it all off. Go through it. It's a pain in the ass, but it's something you need to do because if there's something missing, you need to be able to create an argument saying it's not there like I had to. I'd even go as far as to say, take some video or photos every time you're opening boxes of like we had a, a crate. Um, if I'd videoed that, which I didn't, that would have saved me a lot of dramas because it, there was basically an accusation um, saying that you've got the brackets 
and I didn't have the brackets. Not at all. And I'm not going to argue over $20 part. I don't give a rat's. In Australia, we say we don't give a rat's ass about $20, you know, as opposed to not being able to build the kit. So it didn't, their argument didn't make sense. The other thing too, when your kit arrives, uh, put it on some blocks of wood or something to keep it off the ground. Uh, I think it's called dunnage, just maybe 70 by 70s or in the, uh, the khaki imperial, maybe four by fours. Put your, all your parts and bits and pieces off the ground, put it on the dunnage, it keeps it nice and dry. Okay, tools, uh, basic tools and equipment. Now in saying that, uh, I'll provide a list of stuff that I, that I used. I use a lot of battery tools uh, because just batteries, you don't, you're not draping cords everywhere. They're kind of dangerous. They get a bit, they're just inconvenient. Battery tools are great um, and they've got tons of power these days. So that's my advice. But you do need to charge up your battery stuff. So we had our van, we had a solar panel and an inverter. I was able to run the grinder, which is 240 volts, like mains power. Um, run the grinder off the 1000 watt inverter and that worked great but all the charging I just did off a 300 watt inverter just running it off the sun when there's no sun a generator is something that will be really really necessary and I used the generator near the end of the build when we had nothing but rain some other bits and pieces equipment that is very very handy um, whilst you're building tie down straps for bracing the building You've got your upright frames, you need to brace them from falling over. I use tie down straps. You can use logs or um, timber or whichever is a sensible means of holding those frames up so if the wind blows, they don't fall over and kill somebody. Uh, my tie down straps seem to, to work pretty, pretty good. So that system worked okay. Uh, you'll need clamps. I use like welding clamps to hold bits of metal together, uh, vice grip type ones, and also ordinary clamps. Um, I, I used a three-legged vise, Triton Super Jaws. That came in really handy when I was using the grinder with the cut-off blade to cut bits and pieces down and to bend up some bits and pieces as well. So a little vise of some sort was very, very handy. For drilling holes for the gutters, I used a hole saw, but you can step drill, chain drill, and um, eliminate the, the hole saw need. But also for the door, for the, for the lock set, a hole saw kit. Just made my life a lot easier. Don't need it. It just makes life easier. Working at heights. Okay, my shed, its peak was four meters. Its eaves were 3.4 meters. So obviously I'm working off the ground all the time. You can get hurt. Working off a ladder is, uh, it's like the minimum level of comfort and access requirements. The ladders are pretty good, don't get me wrong. We use the ladder a lot, but I made a work stand. Um, I made it here in my Townsville workshop and drove it up four and a half hours up to the Atherton Tablelands and that, that work stand proved invaluable. It saved me a lot of money on hiring scissor lifts, albeit I've got legs like the Hulk now because I went up and down that ladder about four billion times, maybe, maybe, maybe a couple of dozen times a day, I don't know. If you're investing thousands of dollars in a shed that a couple of hundred dollars in a piece of equipment like that might save you thousands of dollars in higher equipment. Still pretty high, so make it good and stable. I used it, I, I made it light enough, however, that I could drag it around inside on the concrete, which was easy, but outside as well, in the mud. Outside of that, working at heights, you need to be a little bit switched on. Okay, so if you do fall off, you're going to get hurt. I had a friend that passed away when he fell off a ladder. This is going back about 10 years or more ago, um, building a shed, he died, hit his head on the concrete. Be very, very careful with ladders. Whichever, whichever way you go, be sensible with working at heights. Calculate the risks yourself and be responsible for the risks yourself. Lifting. There is, it's all manual handling. Every single piece needs to be carried to the job site from your pile of wherever you put your kit just next to your job site. Mine was about three meters away. But place, place all those, uh, the kit where they deliver it fairly central if you can just just save all that all that walking okay and carrying so I had my wife to help me and Michael my father-in-law to help me during the build for probably three of the four weeks which was um, or at least half the time which was really good so it, if you're going to do it by yourself just expect that you get you have to you're going to get it up with some big guns on you okay now the other thing too you would have seen in my my video 
Uh, I used a tractor, it's only a small tractor. It had a lifting jib on it at the back and I added a lifting jib extension. And I know a lot of people would look at that and shake their head. And understandably, again, you calculate the risks and you own them. So I looked at it and thought the, the moment arm or the leverage out here is great, but the, the more vertical that it becomes, it becomes lesser. For example, a 100 kilogram weight lifted vertically is a 100 kilogram weight. If you go out 45 degrees, I, you, all you engineers would know that that 100 kilogram weight at the point of lift, like here's the lifting point here, but at the, at the point of leverage is gonna be much greater than that. That might be three, 400 kilograms. And if you, go out, if you go out level, straight out, then it's gonna be a multitude of that. It's gonna be a ton or, or more. So it, the track that really helped me a lot, lifting the frames up and some of the bits and pieces, even uh, around the, the, uh, the block of land, just moving some things around with that lifting jib. It's been great. Highly recommend if you've got small acreage, or if you're looking at doing something like this, if you can get a hold of a, a, a tractor, get some tractor awareness about you, know the risks, it saves you back. It's fantastic. Get some tarps to cover all your tools. Tarps as in something waterproof to cover some plastic or whatever, to cover your equipment like your drills and your, your generator and other you know, sensitive equipment. So, or your spanners to stop them from rusting up. Sustenance might be something you, you think that is uh, not important, but it is. Chicken pie. Mm -mm. Found by myself, uh, without Judy, my wife there, I was skipping lunches and just not doing the right thing. And, and I'd work in the sort of late in the day, then I thought, ah, oh, I've got to make dinner. And you, you get something quick. And uh, it's, you've got to think about that plan. Like I kept forgetting, forgetting to get stuff out of the freezer to thaw out during the day to have later in the evening. Think about that, it's, it's important, otherwise you're just gonna, <laughs> gonna get skinny. Skinny is not always the best. Think about your neighbors as well when you're building making noise, okay? So after hours or weekends, there's a time to make noise that people will tolerate. And a time that you're really pushing your luck so be considerate towards your neighbors just need to sit down here for a little bit just uh, buckets good enough isn't it all right um, tech screws these kit sheds are full of tech screws uh, hex headed 5 16ths and 3 8 pretty much uh, size just the tech screw driver just get a couple of them, maybe maybe three or something like that, because you, they do wear out and, they, and you find that they're starting to jump out. The driver starts jumping off the screw head, just chuck it. Well, absolutely make sure that your tech screw driver is magnetic to hold onto it, otherwise you're gonna be going up and down that work stand, picking up all your tech screws off the ground all the time. All right, um, cutting sheets of iron. Everybody who's in the building game will tell you cutting iron the zinc loom or whatever you want to call it with uh, an angle grinder and a cutting disc is a no-no. Um, you should use shears, so um, that's true. The reason being is that you'll, the angle grinder will leave little tiny fragments of metal and it embeds into those sheets, particularly color bond or anything really, and uh, it'll rust. So you get a bit of moisture on it, within a week you'll, you'll have it rust and that can ruin the appearance of your, of your job. Uh, so you use shears, the little snippers. Now just I didn't use shears for the whole build, I used it for quite a bit, but there was times I, my hands were so covered in blisters for my little shear set um, that I just gave up and then I used the angle grinder. And But what I did do was I brushed it down thoroughly, I used a file and cleaned up all the edges so there was nothing sharp uh, and I, it was smooth basically. On, the, on So I gave myself the best chance. If you're just going to cut it and put it straight up, you're going to get rust marks. It's the same when you're drilling off a roof. You need to make sure you sweep down the roof, hose it off to get all the filings from drilling off your roof, otherwise you're gonna get rust patches all over your roof, guaranteed. If you're using the hand shears, it takes a bit of a uh, little bit of skill to, to angle your cuts and to get those right, particularly with the profiles of your, your metal. Um, you'll get there, you'll find that you're getting better and better with each cut. Um, can be a bit tough on the hands. 
Um, or you can get an electric shear, something that makes life a lot easier. If you've got one of those, great. I don't like the nibblers that throw a little crescent of metal out and throws it all over the ground. And later on it gets in your dog's feet or your feet or into everything. I hate those things, but they do cut metal well. More on the tools. Uh, I found that the laser that I had was just a second hand one. I only paid, I think, $100 for it. Uh, it was really, really good great even so the laser helps you to, to identify when something's square or parallel um, and uh, it, it can save you a lot of work you can use a water level I, the shed I'm in right now I used a water level for that it's a bit of a pain in the butt and you need you kind of need two people because you're moving it around all the time measuring the equipment good tape measure at least the length of your shed mine's 20 meters I had a 30 meter tape measure plus an, an 8 meter tape measure had it on me all the time. I was always constantly measuring things and checking things. Chase every single millimeter off as you can because what that does is if you, you can get accumulations of errors along the way. A little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, then suddenly you've got, at the end, a lot of error. Um, so just chase, chase all those little millimeters and your building will be better for it. Drilling concrete. Just need a powerful drill for, for drilling concrete. Um, I, my battery drill I bought again, once again, second hand for about $100 Australian, which is really cheap. I think it's, it's a $300 drill. And uh, it, it just went straight through. I have burned out a cheaper drill before trying to drill through concrete. It just doesn't do the job. Working on roofs, good footwear. Going up ladders, good footwear. You need to be like a mountain goat. I look like a mountain goat. Roller doors. Roller doors are heavy things. So once again, I use my tractor to help me with that. Uh, you can use a pulley system. There's some videos online that show you how roller doors work. The scary thing, which I puck it up a little bit, <laughs> had a little bit of pucker factor, was putting a bit of spring tension on the roller door to pre-wind it. And then you basically could hold it and then unwrap all the packaging. So uh, you might see in the video that I had a little dance, a little chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> I survived. <laughs> if you're not careful, all you might hurt yourself because it's spring tension in a big metal door, so it's going to come un unwound and probably wreck your door. And they're hundreds of dollars. Stopped up again. Damn it! All right, that's about it. So now let's go over the costs. They told me what a bargain I was getting. We're living in the time of inflation right now in mid 2022. So the kit. It cost me 25,835 Australian dollars. It included all the iron for the, for the walls, and it was trim clad, I think it was called, uh, for, for the roof and for all the walls, all the flashing. It included all the bolts, screws, um, all the attaching hardware for the foundations that, to your slab, albeit minus my 150 millimeter ones, which I bought myself, and the kit supply ones turned up 22 days later, no uh, thanks to the company. Still a little bit of a sore point, guys. Uh, but uh, you have to supply your own downpipes to your water tank, and obviously the slab. Insulation. I used just insulation in the roof, and that cost me about $1,070 for that there. My building application fee cost $914. My owner builder license cost me $440. But before you get the license, you have to do the owner builder course. And the course is not teaching you how to build, it just gives you your legal responsibilities, pretty much. $185. To get the owner builder license, I also needed an industry white card. Now, basically, what that is, is a, an industry induction. That cost me $85. The, sh the site that we built the shed on was covered in trees. So we had to get the uh, the dozer in. Uh, that cost us $1,815 to clear the trees. And then I had to, well, he also leveled the site roughly, and then we had to get it leveled later. And the builder who put the concrete slab in, he did that. The scissor lift cost me $300. Now, that was $100 a day. I had the scissor lift for three days. Again, that work stand, which cost me $200 in materials, Save me probably, you'll probably need that works, a scissor lift or something, pretty much from the time you need to start standing your columns up to the time you put the last screw on the roof. 
and the, the wall. Bear in mind you're dealing with 3.4 meters and trying to put screws in on the top of a ladder is dangerous. So you need some sort of work stand. This slab itself cost me $18,000. Just pay the money, they turn up and do the slab and, and, and then they go away then, and you have the slab. All up that cost, 49,464 Australian dollars. That shed cost just under $50,000 with no power, no water, no utilities and DIY self-built with the, with the help of some wonderful people, my wife and my father-in-law, Michael. I'm probably going to starve now. Probably. Yep. But in saying that, the quotes I got were $97,000, around $100,000. So saving approximately $50,000, which is a big deal. And that goes into one of the great reasons why um, you would do something like this yourself. I don't have a job to go to. If I was earning $1,000 a day or more, or maybe less, you would consider doing, getting somebody to build the shed for you. The other thing too is, if I was not able to build the shed myself, I didn't have a, a network of people to help me, um, or I didn't have the tools and equipment or the, the knowledge on how to build, it would be wise to get somebody else to build the, the shed for you. Of experience, how much experience do you need? You do need some experience. Now, if you are already building or a maker, like a lot of you are, and you're building things all the time, then those skills are transferable. You're just building something quite, quite a bit bigger. Um, I have built three sheds, that being my biggest shed that I built. I've built the shed that I'm in right now. Before this one, at another property that I had, I built a, another bigger shed than, than this one. Um, timber, timber truss framed roof, steel walls and all that sort of stuff. So I have had some experience. <coughs> experience is, uh, is, is very helpful, but um, if you've got someone to give you some mentorship or some help that's done it before, go for it. Um, their, their experience will be invaluable, helping you guide you through that build. Overall, it's not that hard if you've got a little bit of common sense and a little bit of practical ability. Another thing I should add in real quick is uh, when you're building off grid, all right, so you, you do need to think about your, your accommodation. Okay, so not only you gotta think about your power and your utilities, you gotta to go to the toilet, you gotta to get a drink, you gotta eat, you need somewhere to bed down at night, and I had the camper van. So uh, when my father-in-law came up, I gave him the camper van and I stayed in the tent and, and roughed it. Um, so a tent's fine if you've got a tent. At the end of the day, you just wanna be dry and sleep well. You don't want to be tired when you're on the job. My camper van, it's got solar power, a lithium battery, a fridge, it's got a toilet and shower. There's a video on it. You can see my camper van in a video. So if you're interested in that, then you can see what I'm talking about there. So I hope that answers the questions that you may have had or the ones I had in the video. Hopefully I didn't skip too many. Um, and uh, you find it useful. And, and if you're looking at doing, doing a project, something similar that, that encourages you and, and is helpful, that's the whole idea of something like this. Good luck with it. If you've got any more questions, put them in the, uh, the comments section down below and I'll get to those. I try and answer all of those wherever I can. Except for the nasty ones, they get missed. Take care, thank you for watching this video and we'll see you on the cottage build.